Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! So here we are with our panel, the first female Lord Chancellor in a thousand year history and the Justice Secretary, Liz Truss. The Labour MP who resigned from the Shadow Cabinet, refusing to vote for Article 50, Dawn Butler. The former Liberal Democrat leader, now in the House of Lords, Mingus Campbell. The Mail on Sunday columnist, Peter Hitchens. And the guitarist from Bombay Bicycle Club, whose campaign for young people to get a Brexit to suit them has over a million, a quarter of a million, I should say, supporters. Jamie McCall. You'll be, great, you'll be grateful for the extra three and a quarter million I gave you. Yeah, but, but no yeah. doubt it'll go to a million. <laughs> well, actually, As we've, a, we've reached eight million young people. Eight actually, million? Yeah. Eight million? Yeah, you've signed on. Your researchers haven't done oh. their job this year. You time. can't <laughs> have gone from a quarter of a million to eight million. Well, it's complicated. We can talk about I it. I bet it is. We'll talk, about <laughs> it. we'll talk about it afterwards, outside. Yeah. Price Waterhouse should be called it. Price yeah. Waterhouse, <laughs> needed. <laughs> Right, just a reminder, you can join the debate as ever on Facebook, on Twitter, or you can text us on 83981 with your, uh, your questions. Let's have our first question tonight. Um, it comes from Nicholas Smith, please. Nicholas Smith. Is it acceptable for people to view indecent images of children without the threat of being prosecuted? The key to this being without the threat of being prosecuted, the National Police Chief Counsel leader for child protection said... Only paedophiles, he said this this week, only paedophiles who pose a really significant threat should face jail sentences because, I quote him, the police cannot cope with the increase in reports of child abuse, up 80% over three years. So only those who pose a really significant threat. Dawn Butler. No is the simple answer to that. Um, we see now the consequences of historic child abuse cases and we don't know how it all started and to even suggest that some uh, some paedophiles are not as dangerous as others is a serious dangerous road to go down and actually it makes me feel so angry and annoyed and physically sick so I actually feel I'm so angry I'm so angry about that, that suggestion so you don't think there's such a thing as a really significant threat? No, uh, every threat is a threat. If somebody is viewing indecent images of a child, then that means that child is at risk and has been at risk because those images have been taken. So just to, to think that you can even discuss that it's not a serious issue or they should be treated less leniently is absolutely wrong. And we shouldn't even, it shouldn't be even entered into the debate. Yes, I know there's a crisis in the police force at the moment, but this is not the way to deal with it. Min Campbell. <laughs> Well, there's most certainly a crisis in police forces. Perhaps we might come to talk about that later. But it seems to me right at the very heart of this is the question of how you assess risk and the extent. If it's a risk, then, of course, that means that your assessment could be wrong. And it seems to me against the background of a week in which the long-awaited inquiry into paedophilia actually began taking public evidence that to make a suggestion of this kind is uh, unacceptable, it's ill-timed. It may reflect the fact that the police are overworked, but there's a way of dealing with that, and that's by giving them more resources. Okay. <laughs> Liz Truss, we will, we will talk about police numbers in a moment, but just stick with the point of Nicholas's question. Um, is it acceptable, and is it right for... Simon Bailey to have said only paedophiles who pose a really significant threat should get jail sentences. Well, I don't, I don't agree with him. Uh, we need to prosecute uh, these people who commit these crimes. And it, you know, Dawn is absolutely right. You know, there are real children being abused at the other end of the video link or 
who've had photographs taken of them. And this is a very serious issue we face as a country. Some of our Crown Courts, almost 50% of the cases are sex cases. Uh, we are prosecuting a record number of people for those crimes. We've seen a 140% increase in the number of people jailed for those crimes. What I would say is that the way we prevent these crimes taking place is first of all working with the internet providers, which we are doing, to prevent these images getting there in the first place. And secondly, making sure our children are properly educated mm. so they understand the danger of putting about photographs of themselves, they understand the danger of internet pornography, and they mm. can actually be protected and understand the risks they face. So it's not so a matter of whether the, it's not a matter of the police. We need to prevent it, not yeah. by saying that people who have committed those crimes should go free. Instead, we need to make sure children are better protected. But he says the police can't cope. That's why he's got to take a different attitude. Is he right or wrong? <clears throat> well, he's actually the chief constable of Norfolk. So I have met him and I've discussed this issue with him. You're a Norfolk the, MP, of I'm a Norfolk. I'm a Norfolk MP and he's the national lead for it. And you know, the police are doing a good job of bringing more people to justice. That's why we're seeing so many cases in our courts. But the long-term solution is to better protect children, to make sure that they understand the risks right, and are yes. less in danger. That is the way we're going to Fine. reduce this heinous right. crime, but not by saying that people shouldn't be prosecuted yeah. for right. it. All right, Peter Hitchens, let's just stick with this, that uh, only those who pose a really significant threat should get jail sentences because the police can't cope. What's your view? Well, my own personal response has to be that I don't know because I don't know enough about it. But I think that we do need to be careful about rushing into a unanimity and saying that just because everybody in this room and everybody in this panel regards the sexual abuse of children with a unique horror, uh, that we can't even consider something being put forward by an expert in this matter who is saying we don't have the resources to do this. It's all very well to sit here and say, yes, let's carry on doing what we have been doing up till now and ignore him. But actually, in truth, you may well find that those who sat here and said this will in years to come because the resources are not there will fail to do that it's child abuse. Wait, 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 i know it's child abuse that's why that, and, 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 the, and that that is the, that there's the point that i've just made that it is is something we all regard with horror there are lots of things we regard with horror as well which are which are also not i have to say being particularly adequately prosecuted or pursued by the the law enforcement systems of this country but the the point is this if you're going to say loudly we mustn't do anything I think you should be careful that people in four or five years' time, when they look at your performance in government, don't find that you have, in fact, done precisely what this Chief Constable is recommending. It's all very well being publicly, fashionably militant about a subject, but it doesn't necessarily solve the problem of whether you've got enough resources to do it. Right. And I think in all honesty, I have to say that because I'm sick of hearing people piling in and saying what they hope everyone will approve of them saying. Jamie McCall. Well, I'm going to agree with Peter, which I didn't think I would do very often tonight. Um, and I agree, it's, it's a question of resources, I think. Um, according to the National Crime Agency, one in 35 British men have a se sexual interest in children. Let's say even a tenth of that number um, looks at indecent images online. That's 75,000 people. There simply isn't enough space in prisons to lock that many people up. So I think you need to look at alternative methods, whether it is, is counselling or voluntary or not involuntary chemical cast, um, castration or, or medication. So, um, as in, yes, let's hear from, yes, the woman in yellow there. Um, I agree with what Jamie just said and um, also that you need to look at the root of the issue and why this is happening. As Liz Truss said, it's 50% of the, of the uh, cases are sex cases so why aren't these people getting the help that they need obviously there's some people that are just evil but you know they obviously need some sort of counseling like jamie just said all right well let's I, I, let's move swiftly on to the second question which is the cause for the comments that were made because what he said was the police can't cope with the increase in reports we've got a question from siobhan holland could we have that question and then that's right, it applies to this. Are cuts in police funding putting public safety at risk? Uh, cuts in police funding putting public safety at risk, and of course this is one area of public safety. Peter Hitchens, you go on that. Not in themselves, no. 
And I think we should be careful not to allow ourselves to be diverted into, a, into campaigns for extra funding. The problem with the police and the problem with the courts and the problem with our entire criminal justice system is that for 50 years they've been doing the wrong thing. And however hard you work at doing the wrong thing, however, however vigorously you pursue it, however much money you pour into it, it won't work. The, the police force of this country was set up by Robert Peel with a simple purpose to prevent crime. Since it abandoned its function of preventing crime by preventive patrolling in the 1960s, under the instructions of the then Home Secretary Roy Jenkins, it has become a reactive fire brigade force which waits for things to happen and reacts to them. The courts are the same. They wait for things to happen. They cease to deter them from happening by, by, by a visible presence of policing. They cease to punish them when they do happen because once you stop, once you stop deterring them, they become much more common. This is also the, reasons why, the reason why prisons are incredibly overfull because exactly the same thing has happened. They've ceased to deter. Uh, the people don't go to them until they've already become habitual criminals, and they are impossible to empty, and they're also impossible to build fast enough to hold them. It would be odd to put them in prison. We, we've got a complete breakdown. Of, yes, and, it is, yeah. and it's not... And I, I was just want to put them in prison before they, they become criminals. One point criminals. on this point of resources. Exactly, right. Before the police reforms instituted by Roy Jenkins, we had, a f uh, we had fewer police... Um, we, we, have, we, have, we have fewer police than, than, than we have now by a long way, either as per head of the country or as a total. They, those of us who remember those times, and uh, alas, I'm now old enough to do so, can tell you that this country was policed far more effectively and right. a far smaller budget in that time than okay. it is now. OK. The woman in white in the back there. And there's her country. Yes. Um, Bedfordshire um, Police came out today as being one of the most mm. underperforming yeah. police services the in the country. The only force rated inadequate, in Correct. fact, in the yes. whole country. Yeah. Um, so my question is, is it's um, fine to say, yes, we need police on the streets, and I think we would all agree with that. However, if the funding isn't in place, how on earth are these police going to get onto the streets? OK, Liz Truss. Well, You pointed out that Bed Bedfordshire was rated inadequate. In fact, two-thirds of police forces were rated good and outstanding. And the reason the inspectorate gave for the good and outstanding police forces was they did focus more on neighbourhood policing. And it is a question of how police forces use their resources. Do you, so agree, forces, do you agree with Peter Hitchens, then, what he says? Well, that, uh, before I, Roy Jenkins, I, it was I all right? I also am going to agree with Peter, because he is right that we should be intervening earlier. We should be preventing crime from taking place. I talked earlier about educating children better about sex and relationships to make sure they understand the potential dangers of online pornography. We've also got the Family Drug and Alcohol Court, which actually works with people who've got drug addictions or alcohol addictions, helping them get off those addictions so they don't end up in prison and they don't end up with their children being taken away. So I think the criminal justice system is moving in that direction and that's the whole point of today's report by HMIP that they're saying so the, the, let's have more focus on neighborhood policing yeah. patrolling to prevent those crimes taking place but this community here um, uh, in in Bedford mm. have been their police force rated inadequate and as you know the number of police forces has dropped by 20,000 hasn't it since 2010 do you mean the number from 124 of police officers yes right has fallen. So what, I mean, can you well, say to them, well, it doesn't well, matter because we're just going to do a the, different kind of policing? The reason, the reason we know that that is the performance of the Bedford for Force versus the other ones is because Theresa May, when she was Home Secretary, created the rating system so the public have that transparency. So people in Bedfordshire can say, and they can vote for their PCC, who is accountable for police in the area and they can say well this isn't good enough and actually other police forces are doing better can we look at what they're doing okay you know, we've got 43 forces across the country and, and places like Bedfordshire do you need to look at what is going on elsewhere All right. you say in the third row then I come to you Min Campbell yes we've got 43 forces do we need 43 forces Bedfordshire is a small county mm. we're close to London there's Hertfordshire and Buckingham which are close by shouldn't wouldn't there be uh, a better use of resources <laughs> if they were amalgamated. Okay. Well, I, said, I said, just in response to that, Norfolk and Suffolk, for example, are working much more closely together. They've integrated their back office so they can spend more money on frontline policing, and I think that's an excellent idea. Okay. I mean, Campbell, can we tie together the first question, which was about 
um, the police not being able to cope mm. with the second question, which is whether there aren't enough police, the cuts in funding are putting public safety at risk. They're two sides of the same coin. Aren't well, I'd like they? to pick up on uh, Peter's point. Yeah. I mean, it's a kind of Dixon of Doc Green view about policing. And no doubt... What, the pre-Roy Jenkins? Yes, the pre-Roy Jenkins. Does anyone remember Roy Jenkins? <laughs> well, I hope they remember Dixon Peter. of Doc Green. I certainly do. <laughs> I'll never forget him. <laughs> but you have to remember that crime has changed. There's no trafficking of human beings. There was no... Uh, incredible use of uh, drugs for raising money. There was no organised crime. And so the task which the police face is very, very much different from what it was in the days of Dixon of Doc Green. And it seems to me that the question of deterrence, which has been referred to, but no one has actually explored, is very, very significant, uh, significant in this. Because if you think you've got a reasonable prospect of being arrested, and ultimately convicted, then that acts as a deterrent. And since the police are on the front line of that sequence, then the more resources you can give to the police, the more effective the system will be. And I think it's quite wrong to say the courts... The courts can't institute proceedings. Proceedings are brought to the courts, and the, the courts have, of course, to determine sentences against the background of the nature of the crime, the issue of deterrence, the availability of alternatives, it's a very complicated thing, and it's infinitely more complicated may, may than Robert okay. Peel oh, no, suggested no, 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 it would be. We can, Peter, but no, no, no. I just want to hear from some more people and go around the panel, and I'll come back to you. Yes. Yeah, I'd like to ask Liz Truss. Um, I think part of the problem uh, is that it's not just about policing, it's about caring about those victims. Mm. I mean, we don't even care about historic child abuse under safe... Is it safe... What's the name of the word? Safe roof. Same safe roof, roof rule. Same roof, Same roof rule. I, I think that should be abolished. I think because you're undermining the suffering mm. that an awful lot of adults now that have gone through childhood yeah. and abuse, but it's only reckoned after, recognised after 79, but not, not before 1979. Right. At, at the very back, yeah, um, back yes. I just want to raise two points. Yeah, I work for Bedfordshire Police, and to say that the cuts over the last six years have not influenced policing in Bedfordshire is ridiculous exactly. because it has. Good people have walked out that door because exactly. they've been made redundant. There's been mergers and Hertfordshire and collaborations. And it's, it's a farce to say that it hasn't affected policing in Bedfordshire because it certainly has. And I just want to raise one more point in that, um, with, as far as the funding is concerned, it's not easy to to say because we're funded as a rural force. We have Luton, which is the fifth largest policing area in, Be in the UK, outside of the Met, and we're not funded to handle those kind of pressures. Okay. Well, <laughs> go on. Go on, Butler. Uh, so, the, the last uh, lady just hit the nail on the head, if you'd like. If you cut, if you make cuts to a service, it will affect the service. It will affect what happened in that service. Uh, the Labour Party brought in the Safer Neighbourhood teams, and in my constituency in Brent, in Stonebridge, we had the first set of Safer Neighbourhood teams, and they would be the same three officers, will always patrol the area. They got to know the area. It's back to community policing as it was, and it worked really well. And then the cuts came in. And we saw that change in terms of the community's relationship with the police and the police ability to do the jobs. Peter talked about uh, prisons being overfilled. I agree, but then we have to look at rehabilitation. We have to look at the courts. We have to look at the probation service. All of these uh, pillars of our justice system are being cut and it affects the system and it affects people and of course it makes people less safe. I got burgled, I was told I had to wait six hours before the police came. I sat there in the cold waiting for six hours for the police to come with the door you know, smashed in and the window smashed in. You can't say you can cut services and it will remain the same. And Ming says that um, crime has changed, it has. But you still need police officers oh, yes. to fight it. You still yeah, need police yeah. officers I don't at that. computers yeah, we're fighting, on the, we're fighting, on the same page. fighting cyber crime. Yeah. So we're, we're on the same page. Still need people. Uh, Jen, <laughs> Jen, Jen Nicole. Well, I actually had a run-in with Bedfordshire police on the way here. Um, <laughs> 
we shouldn't laugh because they, they they did a very good job from what I could see. Um, and, and well, I, I, no, well, yes, don't give on. us the detail. <laughs> but what, uh, what I mean, they did a very good job. I was having a, a coffee in a local cafe as I wanted to wander around the town before, um, and there was a drunk man harassing a member of staff, and they and they came very quickly. Um, but well, you didn't have a run in with them. No, no, I, 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 I thought this was going it. to be an exciting <laughs> moment, yes, revelation. No. Yeah. I was about to offer you legal <laughs> representation. <Yeah. laughs> I, bit, I agree. It's, it's, a, it's a question of, of resources, I think. Um, Bedfordshire's police only spends seven pounds a head um, compared to twenty-five pounds a head for the rest of the country, and I just think it's it's a, another canary in the mine that that public sector cuts are making us less safe and, and less cared for. Okay. There, there, there are a number of people with their hands up, and Liz Truss has heard particularly from the woman at the back there about the effects of the cuts. Perhaps you'd, I know there have been a lot of points raised, but could you answer that one that, uh, that she raised up there? Well, of course, it's about the money we spend on the system and the police budget has been protected. But it's also about the way we deploy resources and the way we use them better. And this is the point about having more resources deployed in neighbourhood policing. That is a decision for the local chief constable. And we do have you know, very varying performance of police forces right across the country. I just also wanted to uh, agree with the lady in the front who raised the issue of the victims of sexual crime. I think there's more we can do to help victims of sexual crime. One of the things I'm doing with the court service is making sure that child victims are able to be cross-examined pre-trial and not have to give evidence in open court, which mm. I think can be very Absolutely. intimidating. The rule cuts out people that have suffered terribly mm. before 1979. Yeah. I don't understand how a day before October the 1st, yeah. you weren't abused, even if you went through 10 years mm. of childhood of abuse, mm. but you are abused if you're so much as accosted by a postman walking along. I'm not being rude. I'm sure abuse is abuse on any level. Mm. I'm okay. saying please acknowledge the suffering, that not just myself, but a lot There's of a people in this country. If that safe rule rule isn't abolished, mm. it doesn't acknowledge us. It's not about the money. It's acknowledging. We don't want another slap in the face. That what happened to us didn't matter. And I think... Can, can we... Sorry, can... Uh, I'll I take that point. Can, I just want... Can, no, can, can, if, if you... As Justice Secretary, you heard what the mm. woman at the back said about Bedfordshire and the police and the changes and all that. What's the one thing you would do positively to improve policing? You have a chance just to say in this country. Well, Is it more money? Is it more police? What would, you, what would you actually want to do? Well, of course, I'm responsible for the courts and prisons and the Home Secretary uh, is responsible for the police forces, but we work very closely together. And one of the things that I think is important is a criminal justice system works as a whole and we work as much as possible to make sure we do things early. So one of the things we are working on is the police having more powers to intervene, to take steps before somebody has committed a serious crime. Likewise with the courts, which is what I was saying to Ming, is actually when a judge sees a, a less serious offence coming before them, I want to see more review processes so that somebody can come back again and again and actually see the same judge and the judge's authority can help prevent further crimes being committed. So I think having people at the front line, whether those are police officers or whether they're judges or magistrates, can help people before right. they commit crimes okay, that end I, up leading right, to prison. I think we're that, we're that we're is very important. I just want just yeah, one keep, I mean, to, to try and sum up the, 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 the whole point here. Quantity isn't everything. As I can tell you from very painful experience, if they give you the wrong antibiotic for a disease, it doesn't matter how much they give to you, it still won't make it better until they change the drug. Until they change the drug, nothing will happen. We are doing the wrong thing. What people want in this country is a presence of authority on the streets, preventing disorder and preventing crime. There isn't, there isn't actually all that much, as, as I, I think Dawn probably knows, there isn't actually all that much that the police officer can do for you after a crime has been committed. He can't put your home back right. together after it's been burgled. Can I make, what we want is for no. police to prevent them being burgled point. in the first place. Very, very quick. So I've got to chair this, and we've got a lot of questions. Right. Our audience very good, wants very to quick ask. point. Very quick. Don't Maybe. be seduced by the idea that amalgamations always produce success. Mm. Scotland has created a single police force based in Edinburgh. As a result, local influence, mm. which previously was very important, 
has literally been put to one side. Yeah, yeah. There's an important relationship between the local community and those who police it. Don't believe that a large-scale right. amalgamation okay. makes that any better. No. So, I'm sorry, I, we, we, if we went on for two hours, I'd take all the points, but I can't, we've only got an hour. And I have to say, we're going to be in Sunderland next week before we go on, and Bogner Regis the week after. We'd like to come to Sunderland or Bog Bogner Regis, the address is there on the screen. We've had lots of questions on our next topic as well. Heather Jones, you have the conch. Should EU citizens' right to live here be a bargaining chip? Should EU citizens' right to live here be a bargaining chip? Um, Liz Truss. Well, we are absolutely clear that we want EU citizens to have the right to live here, but that that has to be part of our negotiations with the European Union. It's going to be an early priority in the negotiations once we've triggered Article 50. But the issue is, at the moment that we have UK citizens living in Europe, we want to protect their interests as well. So they are, so a, bargaining. Wrong. They are a bargaining chip. It, will, they are, it is part of the discussion that we are having with the European Union. Absolutely. And that's also what the other countries in Europe want to discuss with us. It has to be a reciprocal arrangement, as many of the arrangements we have with the EU, whether it's about mm. trade, whether it's about criminal justice, we have to find an agreement. And but hang we're on, very let, me just, let me just clarify this. David, we are three, very confident uh, sorry, we will three, get an agreement. You but... may be confident, but you're saying that three million EU nationals who live here in the UK are a bargaining chip with the EU. Right. What I am saying is the status of EU nationals is, of course, part of the discussion, part of the reciprocal arrangements for when we leave the EU, as are our discussions about criminal justice, one of the things I'm involved in is discussions about family justice Fine. We're talking, and custody we're not arrangements talking about that. We're talking about border. EU citizens, but my point which is was the issue that uh, Heather Jones asked you know, we, we, uh, we need so, to make sure that UK citizens who yes. live in Europe are also protected. Would you agree, we are confident would you, we can achieve would you agree a deal, with Liam, David. Would you agree with Liam, Liam Fox, Fox that, exactly. it, that their status is one of the main cards in the negotiations? Are those words you would endorse? What I would say, in my own words, ah, no, is that it's an important it. part yeah. of the discussion. All right, Peter Hitchens. Well, the European Union certainly regards British citizens on, on its territory as a bargaining chip, so I really don't see why. <laughs> We should, be, we should be at all hesitant about, uh, about returning the favour. So why not just say, yes, of course, everything's going to be a bargaining chip from now on. It's not, it's not particularly distressing to have to admit that these things are going on. We face a long period of extremely hard bargaining. And if we, and if we bargain soft, we'll lose, uh, as you always do. So I, don't, I really don't see why people are being so coy. I don't see why, the, why Liz Truss is being so coy about, about simply saying yes. The thing which annoys me about this uh, is the, the behaviour of the House of Lords. And I, I just can't, I can't, I, it, it's a very, it, it's a very simple point. I mean, I, I'm not actually in favour of referenda. I think they're horrible things, but there has been one and it just can't with a verdict. If, I, if, if, the, if the government came to the House of Lords and said we would like to bring back, as they should, a selective state grammar schools and, and legislate to make that legal again, which it isn't currently, the House of Lords would turn around and say you can't do that, you haven't got a mandate. The same people who last night voted against the, the, against the mandate of the referendum would refuse to legislate to, to, in, in favour of grammar schools because they would say there was no mandate. They are completely unprincipled and their behaviour last night was totally right. unprincipled mean, and mean, should yeah. be condemned. Well. <laughs> uh, Ming, Ming Campbell, you are a member of the House of Indeed, Lords. Anna, you you spoke in this debate exactly. and you voted in this debate. Indeed. Well, go on then. And as you can see, I'm entirely unprincipled about these matters. <laughs> I mean, it seems to me you've got to look at the circumstances here, and it's quite right to mention what, what Liam Fox said, and if I may say so, this is a very elegant way of trying to get round that. But the fact of the matter is that's what he said, and there are people in government, supported by people outside government, who believe that that's the right way to go. There are about three million people living in the United Kingdom who are EU nationals, but not from the United Kingdom. Some of them are mothers and fathers, of British citizens because their children were born in Britain, their husbands and wives of British citizens. Are we really seriously suggesting that we would tell these mothers and fathers and husbands and wives 
that they must be expelled from the United Kingdom. Is that, is, are we really seriously? No, no so, well, so, if you on, don't pick have a deal. Pick him up on the point. No if, you, if you don't have nobody a deal. said that. If you don't have a deal. Yeah, but nobody has what, said that. If they? you don't have a Mrs. deal, May what are you going to do? Weeks ago, months ago, that she would make sure that British and EU citizens would be protected. Months ago. Yeah, well, the way to protect them. The way, the way, because you haven't spoken well, yet. I'll tell you, the way to protect them is by statutory protection. If it was you or me who was engaged in this, you would you... Well, hold, on, hold on. You want to I, listen to Mr Tebbett said yesterday? Yes, I did. Yes, what did he say? He, he called them foreigners. What's wrong with that? What he actually What's said is... What's wrong with it? Wait, wait, what he said was... Yeah. He, What's he, wrong with it? He, he called them foreigners. What's wrong with it? Well, these are people who've made their lives in the United well, Kingdom. Fine. They're married to citizens of the United yeah. Kingdom. They've got children who are citizens of the United Kingdom. All right. All right. Hold on. Hold on. Let's okay. let no, uh, no, fair, no, fair play I, here. Just don't, make, make... No, don't go on interrupting. Make one point. Make your point, if you would. The point is this, that Mr Tebbett said that you're all arguing about this, that and the other because of the... And the will of the people have made this choice. It wasn't Mrs May who's had all this nonsense thrown at her. We have voted to get out of the EU. Did you vote that people who were EU citizens but not United Kingdom citizens should be made to leave the United Kingdom? No, who, Was that in has. your mind? Nobody has. Well, well if the position is... You're right. protecting people M who are Missy, not British. Miss, allow me. M Mrs May, to whom you referred, has said that no deal is better than a poor deal. If there's no deal, what is the position going to be of those citizens of EU countries who are not citizens of the United Kingdom. All right. OK, fine. Thank Hold you. on. Yeah. Just make one point Very there. briefly, Liz, and I thank you, Don. The vote was all about triggering Article 50. It was not about the deal with the EU. We've got the Great Repeal Bill going through later, which will be about the deal with yeah, the EU. Yeah, but what's Ming saying This is, is about... Well, if you what don't I'm get the deal, the then House what happens? The House of Lords are trying to hijack no, we're not. the well, this vote on Article on. 50, Come which on. was simply a question of, well, do you endorse the British all. people's decision to leave the EU? That was all they are being asked. The Great Repeal Bill I've... is coming through. You will have your opportunity, Ming, to fully express your views on all of these issues at that point, and that would be the proper time, not for the Article 50, which is a simple question of yes or no, do you support the will yeah, of the British yeah. people we are, we are, as they right. voted I in think, the referendum? Well, I'm accused of hijacking. They're very quick, they're they're very quick. I think we've had the yeah. point, Meg. I, I, I'm, 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 I'm accused of hijacking. Yes. I accept that the House of Commons has superiority over the House of Lords when it comes to legislation. The House of Lords has passed an amendment, which is going back to the House of Commons. If the House of Commons rejects it, then the House of Commons is sovereign. I fully accept that. I'm not trying to hijack anything at all, but I am trying to re reflect and to represent the interests of the three million people who work in the National Health Service, who work in our universities. <laughs> all right, point oh. made. The woman, all right, no, hold on. No, 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 no. The woman in orange there. One, two, three, four, five. The woman in orange, yes. The two women in orange side by side. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's appalling that people could even consider making people who live in this country, who have made it their home, mm. to send them back. As you said, we have parents. What about the, the teachers we have? If we're going to have teachers who are going to teach French and Spanish to our kids, I'd rather they were French and Spanish people than Italian people than English people. But, what, but Liz Truss says they're going to, they're going to be allowed to stay. They what, are, you, what, but you, you don't not believe know, that? You don't know that. You don't know that. And I think it's abs Who would we get to work... If for anybody else here who works in London, who would be serving our coffee in Pret? Who would be selling us our sandwiches in well, Pret? Yeah. Who, you're not going to get English but people to take those it, jobs. But as I understand it, your point is that uh, there is no guarantee, and Correct. Liz Trust is refusing to give but, a guarantee. But, yes. See, what we have said is that this is a very high priority in the negotiations. That's we're confident it? Exactly. that no. we're confident we will secure a deal with the other EU countries. We do need to protect the interests of UK citizens living elsewhere in Europe. They are also extremely important, and we mustn't forget about them. But okay. what I am saying is that was not what this week's debate in the House of Lords was about. It was about do we trigger Article 50? Do we follow through on the vote of the British people in the referendum? And I think it is bad faith of oh, come on. the House of Lords 
not to follow through well, on that. All right, all right, all right, Mingna, we've heard a lot from you, and uh, very helpful it's been Dawn Butler's <laughs> turn. So, wherever we go from here has to be for the whole, the 100%, not the 51.8% or the 48%. It has to be for everyone. What's the best deal for everyone? And that's what we have to look at. So, uh, there's one, yeah, there's one point... There's 1.8 million people around that, that that work in London. Now, the, the Lord's job is to look at a bill, scrutinise it, and then make that bill better. That's what they do in the laws. That's what they've always done, and that's their job. And that's what they've done here. They've looked at... That's they've not looked, what the bill was they've about. Looked, they've looked at the bill. Well, no, the vote was about leaving the EU, so we are leaving the EU. Now what we talk about is how do we leave the EU and what terms and what is the okay, plan. That is now, a great on, let, 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 her, let her have if a it's a priority, if, if it's a priority that you protect the status of EU citizens, mm. then put it on the face of the bill. You shouldn't be worried about that. Exactly. You shouldn't okay. be concerned about that. Jamie McCall. Jamie. I mean, men can make the moral case uh, better than... Um, I can. I'd like to think about it in a couple of different ways. If, as we're told, the country is open for business, then we, Britain needs to remain attractive to potential migrants. Now, if, right now, if I was a highly skilled migrant or a doctor or a scientist, and I was looking at the UK and considering working there, if I didn't think that my future there would be secure, why would I come in the first place? <laughs> but also, look, any, uh, any sort of leverage that we would get using EU citizens, which we, I don't think we should do, would be less um, valuable than the goodwill that a guarantee of their status would secure. We're about to enter two or more years of negotiations with the EU, and we need to be able to show that we can give as well as we can take. You, sir, in the third row from the back, the man there, yes. Yes, you. I'm sick and tired, actually, of hearing politicians and everybody say that British people don't know what we voted for. We voted to get out of the single market. We voted to get out of the EU. And we voted to become Great Britain again and not part of Europe. So I'm sick of people saying we can't use the word foreigner about people that have come here. My wife is Russian. She's a foreigner. But she's my wife and I'm proud of her. I think we ought to stop messing around and allow Brexit to get on, get out and stay out. Yeah, but um, your, 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 wife, your, wife, your wife is your wife, but she's not an EU citizen in the sense that this... She's not one of the three million EU citizens. What do you say about them, the people who are...? It doesn't matter. I, I live in a block of ten places. Eight of them places are foreigners. But I still get on with them. They're still my friends. So you'd like to see a guarantee given? No. Oh, right, OK. I want England, I want England to look after its own first. Right. OK, right, yeah. and you, sir? With the beard there, no, yes. I speak on behalf of my wife who's been here since 1972. She's worked here. She hasn't had any criminal record. She mm. has got been on benefits. She's retired mm. here. We bought our house here. And now she's got a threat of being moved. She's, she knows this country more than she knows mm. our own country because she spent most of her life here. Do you think that's fair? Liz Truss. I absolutely want to be able to guarantee your wife the ability to stay here along with the other EU citizens who currently work in our country. But it has to be... Luke, we have to, we have to do these things in the right order. The first thing is that we need to trigger Article 50 to get the negotiations started. That is absolutely what the Prime Minister is focused on. That's what this debate is about. And then we've got the Great Repeal Bill, where we discuss the, de the details and the terms of the deal. So that, is the, that is the right moment to we discuss We're going back that. to a fascist state here. You can't just take people out after so many years living here, contributing here and say uh, they're on, about no, nobody, chip. nobody has talked about chucking anybody out well, at that's all. Million, that's no, nobody, that. nobody has advocated it, nobody has suggested it, it's not under discussion. What we need to be aware of is this, that when these negotiations get going, there are many, many very, very hard points, from, from fisheries to, to, to the right to live in places which are going to have to be dealt with by us 
by, with European Union negotiators. If we give away a profoundly important negotiating point before we even go into the chamber, we are simply cutting our hands off. But what is the point uh, of doing uh, this? We uh, just don't do it. And the, the yeah, reason right. for the government's behaviour, I, I am, I'm no friend of this government. I think it's a ridiculous government. Right. I, I really do think that it, it is absurd to, to suggest that the government should give up a key negotiating position just before yeah, but, it goes but, into but, negotiation. But, but, can I just ask you, Pete, Pete Hitchens, do you equate fishing rights with <laughs> his wife and people well, actually I think, I think those, those people whose livelihoods have been destroyed by the by the theft of our mm. fishing grounds James, by the European but, I mean, Union might well equate uh, them yeah. how can oh. they be a negotiating point when the government keeps just briefing that we're gonna let them stay anyway that's 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 not leverage well briefing is br briefing is not negotiable as as, as, uh, as anybody who's been briefed by a politician knows and the woman the woman there in the third row from the back thank you yes okay thanks um, I'm a migrant and I am a foreigner. Uh, I've been in this country over 20 years and I think the real issue that we're not talking about is what the Home Office is doing at the minute. We have in Bedford many cases of people who have applied to have residency. Mm -hmm. They have an 85 page document to okay, fill in. Sure. Um, I had friends who've been living here 40 years, married, have children as well. And what happened? They've been refused to have a British passport. So actually it's already happening now. You know, we're saying, oh no, the government is promising it, but actually the Home Office is making it very, very difficult. And if you want to apply, you either have to be a lawyer or someone who actually is going to spend a huge amount of time to, to read all those documents. So I think we need to be careful, and I think um, Mr. Cam uh, Gim uh, Campbell, sorry, has done a great job. Thank you very much. <laughs> and the, and the, the, one in the second row from the back. You in the blue and white, yes. Um, I think it's um, what Jamie said actually hit it on the head. It's about goodwill. Um, and you're saying about um, we go into negotiations and we cut our hands off if we say that they can stay and we give them some immunity. Well, no, actually, we're, we're doing something of goodwill. We're doing something we believe in. And how can you expect the House of Lords to vote to enact um, Article 50 if they fundamentally believe that we should safeguard those people's rights to right. stay in the UK? Let, uh, all right. We've got... I've, I've got a mistrust just before we go on. Can you answer the point that the woman made there about 85-page documents that even now have to be filled in by people trying to establish residency? Well, it is important. Office? Are you in favour of that? Well, I am in favour of it because it's important that we do have proper checks mm. on people who are seeking residency in this country. And we have had, you know, ever since I've been involved in politics, issues with, you know, things not being processed properly. It's important that the Home Office has control of our borders and has <laughs> proper checks on people so that we know that they're legitimately here in this country. And that is right for everybody who is a legitimate um, individual who, 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 who achieves residency right. or succeeds in, in getting into this country. Right. And well, that, people that... do not like unfairness in the system. And in fact, it was one of the reasons why people voted to leave the European Union is so we could gain full control of our borders. All right. Well, uh, there's still hands up. We can't, we can't, we can't solve all these all these problems in one hour. So I'm going to go on to another. I'm going to go on to another question. Brenda Evans' question, please. Does the Copeland by-election result prove that Labour is slipping into obscurity under Corbyn's leadership? Labour slipping into obscurity. And Tories took a by-election from Labour, which hasn't been done for over 30 years. Um, Jamie McCall, what's your view of Corbyn and Labour? Are they slipping into, obs into um, obscurity? <laughs> well, I think the Labour Party is, is in crisis at the moment. Um, and it's, it's not all Corbyn's fault. He definitely inherited uh, a tainted brand, but he, he's made it far worse. And I think you just need to hear reports of how he goes down on the doorstep to realise that. And You're a me member of the party? I am a member of the Labour Party, oh. but I have uh, <laughs> certainly considered um, uh, getting rid of it quite a lot over the last couple of years. Getting rid of the Labour Party or getting <laughs> rid of your <laughs> Getting rid of my membership right. card. <laughs> okay. um, and it, he doesn't just play badly in, in, in um, Stoke and Copeland um, and in the north, but where I'm from, in, in, in Hornsey and Wood Green, which you would expect to be kind of classic Corbyn territory, it's... it's 
it's a kind of Islington elite, basically. Um, but his, his strategy for Brexit is clearly alienating whole swathes of the party. Um, for me... Which, which bit of his tactic on Brexit? Voting for it? Right, exactly, yeah. yeah. I mean, as, as John Curtis has pointed out um, last week, although most Labour constituencies um, voted for Brexit, the majority of Labour voters in those constituencies were Remain supporters. So I think backing, not, not backing a se second referendum like the Lib Dems are doing, but certainly, I don't, you know, uh, appealing to stay in the single market um, would be more uh, in tune with the voters, I think. Um, but what's your prediction of their future then? if you think they're slipping into obscurity? I, I've got hope for the Labour Party, actually, but I think that they need to start um, focusing on the one thing that both the members, um, the voters and the MPs can agree on, which is that the, the British economy has failed large parts of the country for the last few decades. Um, inequalities between the regions, zero-hour contracts, the dominance of the city, the future of work. I, I want a Labour Party that's going to talk about the fact that 47% of jobs are in danger of being automated in the, in the, the next couple of decades. But la <laughs> Labour needs to be offering a new deal, not sticking to the same line that um, they're the only party that can protect us from, from public service cuts. It didn't work in 2015. And, and it's clearly not working now if the yeah. Copeland by-election is anything to go okay. by. Um, Dawn Butler, you, you, I think, nominated but didn't vote for Jeremy Corbyn, is that right? I did vote for Jeremy Corbyn. You voted Corbyn for Corbyn? Yes, I did. All the way through? I didn't vote for him first, but I first. did vote for him. <laughs> of course. You didn't vote for him first? Well, you had... Yeah. We've got a graduated system, so you vote for first, second, third, Who was your or, first choice? My first choice was Andy Burnham. Right, so you didn't vote in that sense for Jeremy Corbyn, only after Andy Burnham had fallen out. Yeah, but... Yeah. The thing no, is, they're just kind of <laughs> so, yeah, so, but I did vote for him. Though. Yeah, well, yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's very unfair to say I didn't, but right, I did. Well, you voted for him <laughs> and, and, and for Andy Burnham. Uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, which do you prefer? Um, well, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It's not, about, it's not about which I prefer, actually, because, you know, we are all uh, members of the Labour Party and they both stood uh, for the leadership. And the thing is this, is that at that time... I think Labour kind of lost its identity, and Jamie's kind of right. It was like, where was Labour's identity? We were fighting um, whether we were going to support the uh, Conservative Party welfare reform bill, and I couldn't believe I was having this debate and fight in my own party, because obviously it was a bad bill, and it's bad for the people that we cared about. So, you know, and this is why it was important to have Jeremy as part of that mix. And so, right. at that point when Jerry was the only person who voted against it, along with me, I voted against the welfare reform bill, I knew that that was the direction that the Labour Party should be going in. And Come to Copeland and then, and uh, last week's by-election, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the, the um, public opinion surveys show that more Labour supporters are dissatisfied with Jeremy Corbyn than satisfied with him. Right, so... I just want to say there were two by-elections last week, believe it or not, and we won one. Yeah. Uh, and I yeah. want to congratulate Gareth Snell for, uh, for winning that by-election because he gets forgotten in all, of, in all of this. So it was really disappointing to have lost Copeland. I didn't go to Copeland because I suffered from car sickness and I heard the roads are really bad, but I did a lot of phone calls. That doesn't sound like could, a warrior and I could, for... And I, could, <laughs> I, could, I, could, I don't think I'd be much good to them getting there and being all green and sick, so I thought, but... So I did never a, go I did by a lot, car any I did, distance, a, I did yeah. a lot of um, telephone, telephone... Well, you need to fix the, uh, the train system as well in Copeland, but that's another issue. Bicycles, um, bicycles. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> bicycles. All right. I, I got the train to Cape London. So, the most uh, ingenious I explanation <laughs> I've had. I did, <laughs> I, did, uh, I did a lot of telephone canvassing, both in Copeland and Stoke. And what went Shred. wrong in Copeland? And there was lots of dissatisfaction. There was lots mm -hmm. of stuff around uh, nuclear, and they didn't believe that the Labour Party wanted it as part of their mixed energy. So there was lots of and issues. Why, why is there that? was there was lots of issues in Copeland. No, it's true because of what Jeremy's position, you know, used to be, and people just and they made sure that the. Tory party put a lot of leaflets out saying this was Jeremy's position even though it wasn't. So there were lots of issues and it was disappointing and we lost. Okay, now, and the Labour Party but, but has to and the Labour Party has to do better. Okay. Absolutely. When, if we are going when, to win. when your Shadow Chancellor John McDonnell says a soft coup is underway in the Labour Party, planned, coordinated, fully resourced, perpetrated by an alliance between elements in the Labour Party and the Murdoch media empire. Do you believe that? 
Um, well, I don't know what a soft coup is, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not, well, OK, I'm not a, a rough part, coup. I'm not a part of it. I don't know what a soft <clears throat> coup is. But I think uh, John McDonald has explained that, hasn't he? He said that, basically, he was right grumpy. And, uh, and, then, and then now, the Labour Party... We have to talk about where the Labour Party is today. What is the, la what is the language of the Labour Party today? I'm just asking you whether there's a coup the in progress. Of, Try and get rid of him. The language of the Labour Party today, David, is talking about unity, talking about where we are with our policies and what we can talk to people about. And mm. we need to make sure that... Mm. But at the moment, there's a ten-point policy plan. That needs to be whittled down to at least five, because I can't remember all ten of them. And we need to be all singing... <laughs> I know, it's bad. I can read them to you, though, because I've got no, them no, written please. down. No, no, no. But, uh, <laughs> but, and we all need to be right. singing from the same hymn sheet. Okay. You know? Min Campbell. Well, I hesitate to intrude, intrude on private grief because I think in the discussion we've just had between the two Labour Party members, we've identified it's the not problem. Private grief. I agree. Right, I actually, public, I actually right, pub, agree. Public, public with Jamie, that we. Need, grief, I actually sir. agree public that we need to. <coughs> we need to identify what Labour's policies are and what our brand is, and okay. we need to yeah. sell it clearly. But, Min Campbell. I mean, I know a little <coughs> bit about leadership with parties. <laughs> what slipping into <laughs> obscurity? <laughs> oh, oh I'm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on question time. That's not a <laughs> <clears throat> I think Jeremy Corbyn really ought to look himself in the mirror and say, is my continued leadership of this party in the best interests of the whole of the party? <laughs> uh, hold on. I'll go next. Uh, and a moment came in my leadership when it was necessary for me to do that. And if you reach the conclusion that the fact of your continuing to be leader is stopping the progress of the party, then I don't think you've any obligation, any, any entitlement, other than to say, look, I'm going to go and let someone else take over. Now, I'm by no means convinced that someone else would necessarily be able to knit together the different elements of the Labour Party, because you still have what's rather loosely called the Blairite stream, uh, and that's still fairly strong and it's very voluble. On the other hand, you have a lot of MPs who are supportive of Corbyn and, of course, you've got a party in the country that supports Corbyn. That's one great success he's achieved. Uh, a but signed up party, um, uh, people who pay a subscription. Y y yes, it yes. is. I mean, that's been an enormous success. The rest of us are mm. quite envious, to put it mildly. But the fact of the matter is that if you're steering the ship and you can't steer the ship in a way which is going to help heaven, this metaphor is getting rather strained, you really have a duty to say to yourself, look, I should step down and let someone else do it. OK. Liz Truss. Well, I, 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 went, I went canvassing in both Stoke and Copeland. And what I noticed for the first time, and I was brought up in Leeds in the 1980s, and I can tell you the Conservatives were not very popular uh, there at that time, is a huge change in attitude. So I had people coming up to me saying, I've been a lifelong supporter of the Labour Party, but I like Theresa May. I like what she's doing. She's a serious woman. She's got a plan for this country. Yeah, we're not talking about her. We're talking yeah, about whether... Oh, hang on. No, 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 no. you've the done your propaganda. Making, no, Liz. The point I'm making, no, David, is... Let me finish my point. Your point is Labour slipping into obscurity. Yeah, but my point is that people who are lifelong Labour voters, lifelong Labour voters are now saying... We back the Conservative Party. The Conservative Party is the party that understands working people, uh, understands uh, 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 that... The most right. Enough, 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 no, it's it's enough. Insulting. This was it's the most David, insulting, can I just say, Dawn, I actually went... That you are the voice and the, of the working class hey. people. Just don't insult people, oh. it's just outrageous. Right. Give me an insult, right. no. Give me You've... You know, no, hang on, hang on, Liz. To be in fair, Copeland, I you, actually you, spoke to you had a question there. about Corbyn's leadership and you turned it into a paean of praise for the Prime Minister. That's understandable. Peter Hitchens, your turn. I want to try and get one last question. Yeah, well. I, on the question of Jeremy Corbyn, people repeatedly say, I hear it about nine times a week, the Labour Party can't win a general election with Jeremy Corbyn as leader. Well, this is perfectly true. It's not very important because the Labour Party can't win a general election with anybody as leader. <laughs> It is, a, it is a dead party. And the man who killed it was not Jeremy Corbyn. I mean, Jeremy Corbyn just sits on the coffin and moans. The man who killed it was one Anthony Charles Linton Blair. And he killed it, fundamentally, 
He killed it, he, he killed it fundamentally with the Iraq war, uh, which I think destroyed it utterly and, and, and left it completely demoralized. And he then killed it by persuading, uh, by, by, uh, by allowing uh, the huge amounts of money which he used to raise from billionaire donors to shift to the Conservative Party. And the reason they shifted the Conservative Party was because the billionaire donors realized that the new Labour project was now safe in the hands of people like Liz Truss, who is actually a Liberal Democrat, as far as I know. All right. Um, and, and so we have, we, we have a bizarre situation in British politics where the Conservative Party has become the Labour Party. The Labour Party has died and been replaced by the Scottish Nationalists in Scotland. And almost, <laughs> and almost I, I admit it's nearly as bad All right, as come algebra. On, Peter, but you do, oh, hang on, I've had about one-tenth the time. Yeah, you have, uh, what I'm saying is much more interesting than they did as well. Peter. All right. Ah. You said, you said that. You said that. We only have a couple of minutes. Come on. Yes, speak to mind. Um, clearly, the biggest thing in politics at the moment is Brexit. Um, you, you know where you stand with the Conservatives. They're going to deliver on it, and they've said that. The Lib Dems, they want to block it and overturn it. They know that. But you don't know where you stand with Labour. They're mixed messages, and that's the problem with Labour. OK, and the woman there in the fourth row. True. Yes, you. I just wanted to go back to Ming's um, comment that he made that the huge swell of members that joined the Labour Party after Jeremy Corbyn came in. I, for one, joined the Labour Party after Jeremy Corbyn in, and, and having had the previous coup in the Labour Party, he once again won mm. for the leadership of the, of the Labour Party. And I think that it's, it's really easy to, um, to talk about the sort of the, the different... The, the fractions in the Labour Party and use them against the Labour Party. I think there's quite a lot of good things that are going on in the Labour okay. Party. OK. And, and the woman on the gangway there, yes, you. I don't particularly want to be a member or support a party that has a singular direction that I have to adhere to. I feel that I'm quite a complex being, that I have a number of different opinions on a number of different things, and I want to belong to a party that is going to represent all of those diversities all of those diversities that so many of our wonderful nation comprises. Right. And so for me, that doesn't seem like a weakness in the Labour Party. And I, okay. Yeah. Thank you. I'm told, I'm told that I thought our time was up. We have time for just one very quick question from Nino Silvestri, please. Yes, Mr um, Silvestri. Uh, has, a, has a Philip Green done enough to redeem himself, or should we take his knighthood away? Right. Yes or no answers. Round the table. Ming? I'm not interested now, in... Now, yes or no answers. <laughs> <laughs> it's a double-headed question. I'm not interested in his knighthood. What well, I'm interested in the fact he's actually done the proper thing by those who were beneficiaries of the pension scheme who right. otherwise have been very, very I'm sorry, we really are running out of time. Jamie McCall, yes or no? Should he keep his knighthood now or not? No, he may have done it, but in the words of one BHS employee, it was literally the very least thing he could do. Liz Truss? Never. Uh, hey, what? Better late than never. And should he keep his knighthood, which Parliament it's, voted he shouldn't? Keep? It is a massive for the independent committee. Oh. It is. And your opinion? It's a matter for the independent committee. I'm a government minister. It'd be completely wrong Dawn, for me to Dawn Butler. comment. I understand he's 200 million pounds short. I think. Yeah. So. so a knighthood if he gives it, keep, keep it if he gives another 200 million. I'll reconsider it if he gives, if, right, he, if he, if he, if he, uh, <laughs> if he locks up the deficit. <laughs> Peter Hitchens. Well, 88% is not 100% and I don't think it's enough for the pensioners. And as for a knighthood, who wants one anyway? I don't think even Nigel Farage wants one. <laughs> I think he does, actually. <laughs> he does. He does. <laughs> That was, the, that, was the, that was the other question we had, whether Nigel Farage should get a night or not. That we met. Ark's Douglas. What? Ark's Douglas, Ark's Douglas Castle. Well, he was here last week. He was here last week and we were told he'd stopped him getting a night. Exactly. I don't know if it's true or not. Anyway, our time really is up. We must go. I've been 